Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ana Jimenez, coming from Spain, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity to bring these experts uh, coming from France government, OSPO, Japan government, United Nations, LFS. So today we are here to talk about private and public relationships uh, and the government's uh, role and, and the role of open source in helping sustain the United Nations Sustainable Goals. So um, I think we can get started with, with the point. My, my first question, uh, uh, Kusunoki san. Yeah. So you, you have been working with the Japanese government in the digital agency. Can you set light into so what is the status on what is the impact on open source in advancing uh, the digital transformation mm. in, in in Japan? Thank you very much. Uh, this is Masanori Kusunoki uh, from a digital agency. Uh, my responsibility is uh, building a digital society infrastructure such as a social security and tax number system and local government systems and uh, base registries. And uh, in my perspective, uh, we are already provide many, many open data such as uh, uh, geolocation and uh, many, many types of uh, uh, mm, trans, uh, sorry, uh, address uh, translation and uh, but uh, not uh, it's di little difficult to utilize such kinds of data uh, we are now providing uh, geocoder it is a reference implementation of uh, using uh, address based registries and it's very small start to our uh, digital agencies uh, open source publishing uh, we are providing such kinds of uh, geocoder and uh, Another Latron translation tool, and uh, yeah, map map related products are uh, many because of uh, map is the uh, most advanced area of uh, open source in Japan, mm -hmm. I think. And uh, uh, in history, uh, before established digital agency, we have we face many difficulties. Uh, for uh, example, uh, four years ago, uh, we have facing problem on uh, not working uh, contact tracing application COVID-19. This application donated from an uh, individual developer and after that uh, we uh, continue maintaining this application but uh, uh, we uh, publish it on uh, GitHub but uh, we don't care about the issue and uh, uh, our tool don't work but we cannot find it but uh, it already uh, mm, published on uh, issues by uh, contributors. Uh, not, for, not only this, uh, I think uh, uh, maintain open source product is uh, not so easy. We have to make an uh, organization such as uh, continuous monitoring for repositories. But I think uh, mm, it is very important to uh, uh, promote uh, collaboration, not only collaboration, but also uh, troubleshooting and uh, many, many important, and uh, not only that, uh, my, uh, I personally uh, learning uh, IT from uh, open source, when I was a student uh, developing uh, uh, Linux distribution on a uh, quarter century ago, and uh, I think, I feel it is a great opportunity to uh, uh, of uh, learning, uh, collaborating via uh, internet mm -hmm. and uh, tools. And I think it is uh, uh, not only uh, uh, efficient procurement and uh, uh, continuous uh, development, but also uh, education and uh, international collaboration may uh, accelerate by open source, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your work. I, I think we will, in, in a few minutes, we will retake that conversation on 
what vehicles are needed for organizations to make that happen, to make that collaboration and that effective um, knowledge, right? Uh, but uh, coming back to, to the uh, context, uh, I, I will now want to ask Omar. Omar, you, you have been working in the United Nations. You're also part of the OSPAD United Nations. Um, uh, what is your posture or, or your perspective about open source in uh, the uh, creation or the advancement in the United Nations uh, SDGs? Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Omar Mosin. I'm with the United Nations Office of Information and Communication Technology, where I lead a small team of, of uh, open source uh, enthusiasts, as we call ourselves. So. Uh, why partnerships and why open source uh, and why are they important for us? So I just want to, a couple of days ago, the 24th of October was the UN Day. I don't know if you know about that. It's a very important day for us at the UN United Nations. This is where the, what, the creation of the UN, the charter was signed, where at the heart of it, it was at the end of the war where we countries, our government came together, at the time it was 50 government, came together to sign the charter where they said that we, the people of the world, we will work together to make sure that something like this never happens again. And this we, the people, was not we, the staff of the UN, or we, staff of government, or we, private citizen. It's we, it's everybody. It's a collective effort that we will collaborate, we will work together. And then, Fast forward, what does it mean working together in today's world? If you fast forward to 2024, it's really for us, it's, it's, it's open source. It really embodies all the values of, that, of the UN. It's about openness, it's about trust, it's about collaboration. And, and, and really for us now, this is one of the most important uh, drive to deliver on the mandate of the UN. So I just also want to go back to the, this UN Sustainable Development Goals. I don't know, raise your hand if you've ever heard about Sustainable Development Goals. Ah, not bad. <laughs> so in 2015, the, our government, whatever your country, whatever you're from, your government signed in 2015 at the UN this massive effort to say, we will leave no one behind. We will develop. We will make sure we feed the hunger. We'll make sure everybody has access to health. Everybody has access to education. We make sure that our work is sustainable. So they came up with this, we call it the agenda for development and sustain, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Those are 17 goals that touch every aspect of our life that make sure that we all have the same standard and that wherever where you come from, you have a decent minimum uh, 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 standards of, of, of life. But what's interesting, when they, they come up with the 17 goals, they come up that the goal number 17 is about partnerships, and that it's really at the heart. We will never achieve any of these 17 goals if we don't come together. So for us also, this uh, uh, partnership, when that's government working together with private sector, working together with academia, working together with civil society is really for us the key for achieving what we want to achieve. And for that, open source is really another, it's, it's, it's the partnership in the digital world is, is, is you guys, is open source. So what, when, when at the time we were trying to see how can we work, how can we bring group of people who never met to work together towards one goal and we're looking at it and then we said but like these guys have been doing it for decades that's 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 you that's the open source community so now we're really trying to double down on how we could use that power of open source into making sure those 17 goals are done and to to get there first we started by us getting ourselves ready to adopt open source so this is where we 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 came up with something called the UN open source strategy that uh, we, we, we're in charge of implementing. So this is to get us ready to us internally start using open source so we can make sure that our government are, or we know how to collaborate with the rest of the world. So this strategy has three pillars, policy, culture change, and, and, and technology. Culture change is really important, is key, because it's not in our DNA to work, to be open. We're 
public uh, international, we're public administration, it's an international organization, so it's not in the DNA of any public administration to be open. It's actually the opposite. It's in our DNA is to be closed. I've never presented open source to anybody at the UN who didn't tell me, no, 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 we can't do that. This is actually probably the first time I'm speaking to people who, who know, who, I don't need to convince that open source is good. I've never spoken to anybody who says it's confidential, we cannot publish. <laughs> no, it's not. So we had to do a lot of explaining, communication, training, outreach to explain that, no, it's actually the opposite. You will gain a lot more from giving. So this is what we did, asked for it to be, to be ready, and then now we're starting another trend where we work with the UN agencies. So the UN system is 30 plus agencies, so we try now to bring that everybody is at the same level ready to adopt open source so we can collaborate with all of you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now uh, I have a question for, for you, Sujata. Because you have been um, with us, I love as a board member, I, I imagine you have been working, you have deep experience with uh, working with the industry and with governments on solving technological problems through open source. So do you have any use cases or stories to share here with, with the audience? Yeah, definitely. So like you said, I have been uh, involved with LF and LFH for quite a while now. And uh, I started my career uh, in networking software. So like you were mentioning, Omar, uh, the default in networking was closed. So, you know, the vendors that you know, like, you know, you can take the names Cisco, Juniper, of the world, they had vertically integrated solutions. But today, we all know networking is open, software-defined networking and, you know, um, uh, Virtual, uh, virtualization that uh, has made cloud as we know it possible today. We all talk about AI. Where does AI train? In cloud. And what has made it possible? It's the networking, virtualization of networking. So I've seen these small open source projects started by a small community grow into industry neutral de facto standard and that is the power of open source. Now, coming to the present day, uh, I'll take two uh, examples of private and public uh, collaboration. So, for example, uh, there is a project called Fledge in LF Edge. It is a project of, uh, like, you know, uh, industrial, it has uh, been implemented in Industrial 4.0, in the IoT, agriculture, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, so French government had a problem, uh, the transmission system, the energy transmission systems were old and uh, they wanted to digitalize it and make it smart. And so they were looking at the open source projects which would meet their requirements to make their grids intelligent and Fledge Power basically met their requirements. So uh, there is an industry standard uh, in, um, in the power grid and uh, in collaboration, RTE, which is the transmission uh, 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 distributor for the French government, in collaboration with Dutch transmitter um, agency, they collaborated and uh, they came up with uh, something called frog lamp. So that has been implemented to make the grid <coughs> smart, to uh, implement sustainable energy sources on the grid. And today it has opened up as a result to 67 uh, energy companies and 167 distributors as we speak. So that is the power of open source, the collaboration between private and public entity across the borders has happened at a neutral body like LFH. Now I'll come to another example. Um, so I am from India. Uh, those who are from India probably know, and those who are not from India also might have heard of a project called Aadhaar Card. This was a project uh, that was started by the Indian government, but it was entrusted by somebody who, ha who was responsible for 
the Indian IT revolution uh, by a private entity, entity. The company's name is Infosys, but one of the founders of the company is Nanda Nilkani. He was interested with implementation to lead the implementation of Aadhaar card. So fast forward, I think this was done 15 years ago. Um, about 1.3 billion ID and identities were created using Aadhaar card. And uh, I have these numbers with me. 18 million authentications happen every day. Uh, why is this important? Because before this, almost 30 to 40 percent of government subsidies used to go to fake IDs because there was no way for government to verify the identities of people because it was so um, uh, segmented. Uh, after Aadhaar card, like it's irrefutable, like you know, people can't forge identities, so it's it's become possible now. The government could have, you know, kept the solution closed, but they didn't. It is open source. So uh, out of that came an open source project called Beckon. Raise your hand if anybody has heard of that project. Oh, nobody. So I guess <laughs> now you can Google it. Uh, so out of this project now, there is a UPI payment system that has been created that act makes 8 billion transactions every month. And 50 million merchants are on this uh, UPI, and uh, the even like you know street vendors are able to take UPI payments for as low as 10 rupees, which is like one tenth of a dollar. So this is a really good example of open source, which is level setting the field. Uh, there is a lot of solutions being built on top of it, which are uh, putting uh, power back into the people's hand. One of the initiatives is called Nama Yatri. So basically the drivers in Bangalore and Kochi are taking uh, power back to themselves and using backend solution to uh, you know, do ride share application. So in five months, they are doing 14,000 rides a day, so they decide when they want to write, what is the you know fare, etc. So they are not held hostage to, you know, the brokers. I mean, we all know the ride share and gig economy is like you know, sometimes not really good for gig workers, right? Mm -hmm. Not get into details, and it has 400k drivers, and um, on the you know um, on sustainability. So Beckon is also being used to uh, integrate different kinds of public transportations. So today, you know, government has, for example, invested in metro or train system or whatever, right? But not every time, you know, the last mile connectivity is uniform and sometimes that becomes a deterrent, especially like, you know, how do I get to the train station? Do I take a taxi? Do I take a bus? Uh, it may get also get expensive. There is not one, you know, for example, flight flights are um, homogenized now. I, I can, like, you know, have a flight going from Tokyo to uh, San Jose via Frankfurt. One leg is with Japan Airline, another one with Frankfurt, but, uh, sorry, Lufthansa, and one ticket would work. But that is not the case in, like, you know, public transport. So with Bacon, that, has, that is being implemented right now. Um, uh, it's been implemented in uh, Bangalore. Uh, there's a three-city solution which is being worked on. San Leandro, uh, California, and uh, uh, Amsterdam, Netherlands. Um, uh, another uh, sustainability solution is like, you know, how to open up um, electric vehicle charging access points. Mm -hmm. So um, also small merchants, grocery merchants are getting on a platform to find customers without getting you know, sucked into, we all know some brokers which are monopolizing the economy. So mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much, Suyata. So let's now move uh, to Europe. 
and uh, what is the status of uh, open source adoption in, in the public sector in, in Europe? Actually, uh, as a European citizen myself, I'm, I'm really into that and really interested to that. Uh, so um, let, let me start with you some uh, data that I have here uh, from a recent uh, study from the European Commission. So, Based on that report, uh, they predict an increase of 10%, that an increase of 10% of contributions to open source will annually generate an additional 0.4 to 0.6% on GDP in Europe. Uh, and, and that is amazing. So uh, in light of this, uh, there are, there's been a movement from organizations, from mainly from the public sector, but we are starting to see also in the private sector, uh, building or staffing talent, needed talent capable to manage open source operations. They are doing that through vehicles called OSPOS or similar uh, FOSS initiatives, right? Um, and uh, we, we have seen it uh, being established around governments from the Netherlands, France here, uh, Germany, and even in municipalities. For instance, in Spain, uh, the, the country where I'm from, uh, there is a north area called Galicia, and they also have established an OSPO uh, because of public money, public code. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know that, that quote. Um, and, and, and it's been a, a really big momentum to how to position it open source as a driving innovator and to leverage digital transformation. So, uh, Bastian, uh, my question for me is if uh, you, could, you have been working with different governments on building uh, solutions and putting op emphasis on open source and how open source projects can be the key to, to driving that digital transformation in the public sector in Europe. Um, could you tell us more on... Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. So I'm, I'm Bastien Gary. I'm part of DINUM. DINUM is responsible. It's a small administration from the French government, and it is responsible for the digital transformation of uh, the ministries. We don't di dictate this transformation. We try to provide solutions and uh, strategic advice so that the ministries can implement those advice. That's very important to say. We don't have power over all the ministries. Hmm. And um, I would like to try to say three things. So where the French OSPO come from, what we do, and why I think it matters. So in France, like in many countries, we have, and we, we talked about this in Japan as well, hmm. we have a long history of open source hmm. in the administration. Like 25 years ago, we all mm. started with experimenting stuff, mm. trying open office and libre office in some administrations, mm. installing um, Apache, HTTP <laughs> servers everywhere, and so on. Mm. So there is a long history scattered through all the public agencies. But what happened was four years ago, and you mentioned mm. the European Commission study, mm. at the exact same time, four years ago, the European Commission started its own open source program office. Hmm. And that was key for France for realizing that we needed to gather all the expertise in the same place to make a big push to, to leapfrog this cultural change that Omar also mentioned. And that's where we have, that's uh, where we come from, from the realization that we had to gather all this expertise to bring uh, the open source uh, to other ministries as well. Before that, there was a sense that open source is everywhere. We need to focus on open data only. <laughs> um, but that's not true. Mm. We already started to do some code as uh, under uh, a free software license, like mm. the GeoCoder that mm. uh, Kosunagi-san mm. mentioned. We did the same in France. Mm. And bit per bit, we had these uh, source codes mm. that we needed to take care of. And so we had to. Uh, put a, a real energy and to get real about what, what can we do with all this source code? Mm -hmm. Can we share it? Mm -hmm. Do we use the proper license? Mm -hmm. uh, do we try to get contributions and mm -hmm. why? So mm -hmm. all these questions, we needed to have the OSPO mm -hmm. for them. So the second question, what we do now, we do mainly three things. We consume open source, mm -hmm. 
we create new projects mm. and we contribute back. Mm. The example you mentioned about our collaboration with Germany is about contributing together to the same open source libraries that we need to build digital workplace for civil servants. For years, companies have been selling us the same software over and over. We've <laughs> been paying too much for that. Mm. We need sovereign open source tools for civil servants. Mm. And in France, that five millions of civil servants, that's a lot. All the teachers, all the, think of all these people. Some of them very knowledgeable about free software in general. Mm. So we needed to answer this. It's unfair to pay too much. Mm. It's unfair to pay twice for the same software. Mm. So we yeah. had to stick to the public code, public money mm. uh, uh, slogan. Consume is one thing, create is another thing, and we had to promote the open source project we were doing in a better way. Because m too often we leave civil servants do their stuff Mm. They do great projects, but we don't put the money to help them promote the project and get bigger. Mm. A counter example is Scikit-Learn. Everyone knows Scikit-Learn because mm. it received the good attention at the right time. Mm. Uh, it could have received it earlier, but mm. at least it's there and gets promoted. So in collaboration is very important because the good thing about having an OSPO is that no OSPO is an island. Mm. Uh, the German minister, Markus Richter, insisted on this at the OSPO for Good conference, like we need bridges between OSPOs. Mm. And the same as you have uh, this OSPO in, in municipality in, in Spain, mm. we have an OSPO in Paris. Mm. Oh. And we are collaborating with the, 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 the OSPO of Paris and we are collaborating with the German Sovereign Tech Fund and so on and so on. And finally, why does, does it matter? Is, if you remember, 25 years ago, there was this big replacement from free software to open source. Mm. Uh, there was a fight over the terms. Mm. I come from free software, and then suddenly open source was everywhere, and there was this internal fight. Mm. Perhaps tomorrow, governments will not be about open source. They will be about oh, digital public infrastructure, <laughs> uh, digital commons, mm. or sovereignty, or other terms. Mm. And if you're here, I guess that's because you care about free software and open source. Luckily enough, free software and open source are exactly the same licenses, so it's, mm. it's fine. There is no fight anymore. Mm -hmm. But for the future, we need to focus on open source because it provides key elements that we need, like mm. the ability to fork, mm. the ability to have more freedom on what we use, mm. what we create, what we contribute to. Mm. And this sense of contribution, this collective responsibility that all governments have regarding the open source stack, that's what started with the Sovereign Tech Fund. Mm. And I hope we're gonna have some European level initiative for the Sovereign Tech Fund. We already have great initiatives like the Software Heritage, gathering uh, and archiving all the source code, but we need to uh, increase the awareness of the, the, the treasure we are all developing and the need for more care and more attention to this treasure. Mm -hmm. Not just in terms of cybersecurity, but also in terms of maintenance, uh, diversity of the communities and so on. Thank you. So uh, just to end up with, uh, if uh, you, you all of you could provide like a, a short wrap up message that you would like to, for the audience to, to take. Uh, Suyata, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, sure, uh, definitely. So uh, you mentioned diversity uh, and collaboration, right? So uh, one of the, uh, we were discussing about this earlier that uh, open source, yes, it's like a really welcoming and open place, but there is work that needs to be done uh, in terms of uh, diversity. Um, and one of the problems that we have, we talked about yesterday in our discussion was that the reason why it, it is an unequal space is many times open source is run by uh, people like me who are paid by corporations to contribute to open source projects. Uh, but there are people who work for their career or you know advancement of their career in open source and like you know to be seen to be heard but these uh, tend to be uh, 
people who, for lack of better term, like, you know, have more time at mm. their hand. And that traditionally, like, you know, that creates a lot of gender diversity, sadly. Um, so that is one. The other thing is that uh, the open source is always trapped for resources in terms of time and investment. A lot of corporations, they use open source, but they do not give back to open source. And I say that from my experience, it, like, it doesn't matter where the company or organization comes from. Uh, that is a symptom that is there in almost all of the open source communities. Uh, so my point is that the organizations need to take a stock of what are they consuming in terms of open source. And then based on what they are consuming, decide how much to give back. Because no matter how much, you know, it's open source, it's free. If nobody is putting resources back, it's finally going to dry up. So it is in the interest of corporations to pay people to invest their time and money into the open source. And that will create one, a more equitable space, and two, will keep the communities which these organizations depend on thriving. Thank you. Um, Omar? Uh, just a closing message for me, like, I just want to go back to what Bastien mentioned, that uh, the OSPO of France has the same problem than the OSPO of Germany, who have the same problem than the OSPO of Mexico. I can guarantee you have the same problem than the OSPO of, of Japan because it's really hard to push open source within a very distributed, and as Bastian said, you cannot dictate, you have to work with everyone. So it is an expertise that is very rare, very special. So what we're trying is to connect the OSPOs. And I think it's really key that OSPOs manage to help each other, that a solution that works in a country, I can guarantee you, high chance it will work in another country if we put them together. So this is why at the United Nations we started a conference called OSPO for Good. It happens every year. Last year, uh, this year, sorry, was the second edition. We had something like 600 attendees who came from 40 plus countries. We're happy we had several uh, from Japan. Would love for you guys, please, there is a page that will go on January asking if to register if you want to attend. Last year, we had a very small presence from Japan. We want to have more of you. We need to hear your voices. It's a two days conference. Next year, we're working to make it an open source week. So please register. We'd love to have you all there and, 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 and contribute. And the second thing, just to close on, uh, at the UN, we've been building on something called UN Open Source Principles. We want to tell the world that if you work with us, here are our principles. Those are eight, and they will be working for all the UN agencies, UNICEF, UNDP, WHO, everybody agree on these eight principles. The first one is open by default, and the second principle is contribute back, back to what Sujata said. Mm -hmm. And now going go through all eight, they're gonna be published, hopefully, end of November, and we want as many organizations as possible to endorse them. So please, they will be there. By endorsing them means that you also would believe in these eight principles, and that we, believe them, we want them to become more of a standard. So these are coming your way very soon, so please stay tuned, and uh, hope to see you all in OSPO for Good at UN headquarters in New York this summer. So, fun fact, <laughs> this panel would not have happened if we had not met at OSPO for Good. <laughs> so this, the reason we are here is because of OSPO for Good. <laughs> Kusunoki-san? Uh, currently, uh, Japanese government don't have uh, official formal OSPO, but uh, I understand facing the same problem in uh, worldwide. And uh, <coughs> currently, uh, we are focused on just uh, involve a citizen developer in Japan or uh, incubate. Uh, community in Japan, but uh, not only that, we have to open up channel more globally, I think, and uh, it, it, it important. Uh, we currently uh, facing problems that one is uh, uh, many, many projects are 
sale because uh, they have responsibility on their own project because they, uh, yeah, they don't want to collaborate on uh, one time frame or one, but uh, I think it is uh, inefficiency in uh, Japan and the uh, world. I think uh, uh, what is, uh, um, I, I have to consider how to uh, join such kinds of uh, trends. And uh, mm, thank you very much. Mm. Thank you. And uh, mm. Basin? Yeah, uh, quick word just to say that we are trying to build some kind of OSPO factory. We want OSPO mm. everywhere, so we are building tools to help other countries to build mm. OSPOs. We want you to test these tools, for example, if you're part of the higher education and research in your country. We have this ministry very mobilized on open source in France, and they have, um, for example, handbooks on GitLab and other tools like that. So come to us uh, uh, and please fork. We are doing great stuff, but they are only great if you fork and use them and provide feedback and, and perhaps contributions. And please fork. Okay, so thank you so much for the panelists for sharing your insights. Thank you so much uh, for the audience. Nihonjin Minasan, Kita Kurete, Arigato Saimas. And uh, see you around.